from the audience at some point. Wow. Uh, where do I begin? I think I, we, I always begin with, with where does this come from? What, how did you come to this story, both of you? Um, uh, how did this become an idea for a Pixar film? Um, well, Darla and I both work on Toy Story 3 together. And um, when we finished that, um, I started thinking about what was next. Mm -hmm. And I actually had, I think, three different ideas that I was kicking around. And one of them, I had the, the, the idea of telling a story set against the other white folks. And the origins of that, I had long been interested, as long as I could remember, I'd been interested in the artwork, the folk art. Um, uh, around the, 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 the celebration, but I, I honestly didn't know a lot about it. And so I started doing a bunch of research in earnest, reading a lot. We started bringing in some, um, some experts on um, the other market. And the more that I learned that the, the celebration was not really about death, it's about you know, life, it's about um, this obligation that we have to remember our ancestors and to pass their stories along and to keep their memories alive. Um, I, I, I started to see more and more the potential for telling um, a really rich, entertaining, colorful, musical story, but also a story that could have a lot of emotion. Um, and of course, we're always looking for all of those components uh, in, a, in a potential story. And it, certainly <coughs> and it certainly has a lot of opportunity for uh, animation and uh, uh, even cartooning. As I, as I looked at the characters, you know, uh, uh, it, it just evokes you know, classic cartoon. Right. Well, that's the thing. I mean, you know, we always think, like, why, why are we doing this film? We, we, right. We've had plenty of ideas where we think, well, this is just a good idea, but it doesn't feel like the this is just kind of you know, live action. Why are we doing it animation? And in this case, um, I mean, definitely the fact that we were going to have a lot of skeletal characters, I mean, right away we knew there was a lot of potential for a lot of great animation and uh, caricatured animation that we could have a lot of fun with. And the end the day. Yeah. Right. Um, and um, let's get through the, the tale here uh, quickly. The uh, uh, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> so and, and, and so Michael, when, um, music is obviously very important in this film. Um, when, when did you get involved, and uh, how did you? I mean, this is different from the superhero movies and other yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I, and, and it was actually. I got involved earlier than normally in the film because there's so much music in the film and some of it is score, some of it is song, some of it is uh, just music that is being played on the streets in their, in their village. And that's the kind of stuff that we went after first. All of the, what they call source music. So if a girl is running down the street and he passes a trio of guys playing a trumpet, a guitar, and, and a guitar, and, you know, we actually wrote music that we could record, and then uh, the animators could animate too. And that was all recorded down in Mexico City with, with uh, Mexican musicians and just these incredible, incredible group of people that, that were brought together. Um, and we were working with Camilo Lara and, and Jermaine Franco, who were you know, sort of our resident experts on, on Mexican music. Um, because for me, Growing up, like my dad had this record called The Music of Mexico, and this is no lie, and I used to sit in the basement and listen to this thing over and over and over, and I loved it so much, and I thought, I know Mexican music. I literally knew nothing about Mexican music. <laughs> and when I met uh, Camilo and Jermaine, and, and, just, and, and they were this incredible resource for me to just, any question I had, anything I needed to know, they were there for me. Uh, I knew what I wanted it to feel like. I knew the spirit of the music, so it just all started there. Um, did you uh, work with the uh, Lopez the, uh, songwriters? No, I didn't. They were on even way earlier than, than oh. I was. So uh, that song, Remember Me, was written long before I came on board. And I remember there was a time where we wondered if 
remember me would figure in thematically mm -hmm. to whatever music ended up getting written, but we never ended up doing no, that. No, we never ended up doing that. It was more about, you know, I think the score was about giving characters their own things and their own identities and, and, and not just the characters, but just the world themselves and the, and the situ character situations and the uh, environment. We wanted to make sure everything had its own identity. Okay. And now, Danny, um, the uh, character Art director. Does that mean what? Did you design all the characters? I'll, I'll yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> figure. Yeah. There's a there's a huge team of people, not just designers, but all across the board, from modelers to animators to the lighters and the shaders. Uh, everyone who's all, just takes your character a step further. So basically, my job was to kind of see characters that were approved in art form, design all the way through finish to get them on model. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, were there any particular characters that you uh, designed yourself? There's not one thing I wanted to actually say I designed all on my own for that reason alone because it's say I sculpt or I, I designed a, a drawing of Miguel that happened to be pretty close to what we like. That drawing goes to a sculptor, and that in this case it was Greg Dystra, our sculptor, who would do and add his own level to it. And then from that point on, it would go to a modeler, and that model would add a little bit more to it. And then it goes to articulation, where they figure out how to make the model move. And then there's little things in there that are just being designed as well. So every step of the way, there's something being plus on these characters. But it, 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 that's what I love most about being in a studio environment, is working with a team and creating these characters that hopefully I don't want to work with. Yeah, and and lot of, you were totally involved all the way through. Yeah. Every step of the way, you were supervising and making sure everything was. And a lot of it's uh, inspired by your family. Absolutely. Um, so I always feel like in order to design authentic characters and avoid the stereotypes is to draw from real life experiences. And for me, in this case, since I am Mexican, I grew up around a lot of people that look like that on the screen. <laughs> and so it ended up being really good reference for me just to naturally go back to that and look at that and say, hmm, I did have an uncle who was kind of a bigger guy and kind of like you, that's what you guys saw. And he, his name, my, my, my uncle's name was Theo Chucha. Yeah. And what he used to do, he used to always rub his belly. And uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then he, he had these oily hands because he liked to work on cars. And so uh, he would mm -hmm. pull me in. Uh, Come on, he called and pull me in his stomach. And I'm like, oh, that smells like gas. <laughs> <laughs> that, that reminded me so much. But it's, all, it's those little details that I would think of when drawing. Like, if I'm working on. Berto, for example, then I would think of those moments, and I probably, I, I probably did a few drawings of Berto doing that exact thing, but even though he doesn't do it in the movie, but I would do it just to see how much character we could pull from it. You really wanted that soccer shirt on? I yes, another one, yeah, really. <laughs> I mean, when, when you go to any Latin country, right, there's this, this love for soccer is just enormous, and so I felt like, well, definitely, if we're going we're gonna to do a movie in Mexico, one of them is going to be a Mexican Soccer Federation fan, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to wear that jersey whether it's stinky and he doesn't fit him anymore, he's still going to wear it. And, um, but it, it was kind of tricky because I had to ask Darla and Lee, it's like, uh, it's, it's Adidas, so how do, you, how do you make that work? How do you get that in the film? So, you know, thankfully we worked something out and it's really cool to see that in there. Yeah. Lee, um, one thing, of course, in the film is that it takes place or at least visually, we see different worlds. We see the world of the, the land of the dead. We see uh, we see the real world. We see old movies. We mm -hmm. see the past. You know, there's all these different aspects to the visuals. So can you talk to that a little bit? Um, sure. Um, I always wanted the film to be kind of timeless. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't. So we avoided any kind of. Like nobody's got cell phones. The closest thing was that uh, the, the computer at one point. Yeah, we put the we put the old Mac yeah. uh, in the uh, <laughs> land of the dead. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a little homage. A little homage to tea. Yeah. Because um, I had this notion for the land of the dead, for all the architecture and everything, I had this idea that buildings kind of appeared there when they were torn down, like when things were thrown away or destroyed in the living world, they would kind of appear in the land of the dead. It's not anything that we show overtly, but that was kind of a guiding philosophy. So. That would make sense why an old Mac would be there. Um, but um, I tried to avoid technology in the land of the living um, in Santa Cecilia just because I wanted this, I just want this film to play, you know, whenever, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, and not feel tied to any particular time. Right. Um, 
you know, so, you know, we, we do reference a lot of old Mexican cinema in the film. We watched a lot of old Pedro Infante and Jorge Negrete films. And, uh, I don't know those people, but I was going to ask you, one of my questions was, was uh, De La Cruz based on any real performer, or, uh, or was he a composite? Well, he, I mean, he, he's not based on anyone in particular, but again, there are, there are some very famous uh, Mexican figures that we, um, that, that inspired us, like Pedro Infante, Jorge Negrete, and there's a living singer named Vicente Fernandez. Um, so there are a lot of these people that were kind of larger than life, and we wanted to create in De La Cruz a character who was kind of bigger than all of them. It's like the, supposed to be the most famous figure ever to come out of, uh, of Mexico. Um, and so we, you know, so we did reference those people, and they're actually in the movie. They all have cameos. Um, people who don't know who they are won't notice them, but... Um, but I did recognize Santos. Yes, El Santo. Okay. Yes, El Santo is there. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, there were a bunch of Mexican celebrities there. Um, that's a little nod to, like, I mean, remember when I was little, growing up on Warner Brothers cartoons, like, the, you'd have, like, an old film that would have, like, uh, Edgar G. Robinson, Edward right, G. Robinson right. and um, other people. I didn't know who the hell they were when I was a kid, but I figured they were famous. And right. So we thought it, it just felt right to have these kind of different figures in the film. But to your point about the, 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 the world, um, yeah, I mean, I, I wanted it to feel timeless. Um, in the land of the dead, we had a philosophy about how the world would be constructed, that, um, you know, people are always dying, and so this would be a world that would be constantly being added onto, and that there would be no uh, safety codes, like there's no handrails on stairways or anything, because you know, everyone's dead already. So <laughs> if you fall, it's more of an inconvenience than anything. Um, so uh, th those towers that you see in the Land of the Dead, they, they all start with kind of Aztec Mesoamerican pyramids down at the bottom, and as they go up, they get encrusted <coughs> with kind of newer and newer architecture until you get to the very top of them where you see cranes and stuff under construction. And, uh, and then we just we built those towers and then just kind of made a lot of them and populated the whole world so we could get this kind of infinite feeling. Uh, it reminded me, of, you know, it was an editorial thing here, but um, I liked how I got to learn about the, this, this holiday and also the way their family works and how that, that works. In, in the same way that um, we learned a lot about uh, South America and Mexico through the old Disney Three Caballeros and things like that. I was, the interesting thing was that it, you know you didn't throw in any of those references to any of those Disney things. I just thought that was interesting. I, I, I was literally thinking that they're probably going to throw in something somewhere. We had an early version where we had a scene where there was like a daycare center mm -hmm. for little kids and. and um, it was like Lost Children or something. Yeah. And, and we had them all sitting around and watching a TV, and on it was the old Disney, the old I work oh. innovation of the dancing skeletons. Yeah. That was in a while. Yeah. Well, I think it's old film stands with it. <laughs> 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 I 